The People's Democratic Party, PDP, declared on Wednesday that Saturday's presidential election will provide an opportunity for Nigerians to pass a resounding verdict on the failures of the administration of the All Progressive Congress, APC, after eight years. Addressing a press conference in Abuja, PDP's National Publicity Secretary, Debo Olugwamba, said the presidential election is about the issues that affect Nigerians on a daily basis and a simple comparison of statistics from 1999 to 2015 under the PDP and from 2015 to 2023 under the APC. The PDP spokesperson also noted that matters were compounded by a debt accumulation of the APC government from 12 trillion in 2015 to a staggering 44.06 trillion today. On their plans for the elections, we're being joined live by Frank Schreibu. He's the special advisor on public communications to Atiku and Okowa campaign organization. Mr. Schreibu, it's so good to have you join us. Good evening. Good evening, I, my pleasure. How, how are you doing? Great. I'm good. Uh, I, I want to go straight into, you know, the, the, the thick of it. Now, we know that we're just about... After today, it's just 24 hours to the elections, and the average person is looking at all the political parties and seeing if they're crossing their you know, T's and dotting their I's. But let's start with the recent poll um, that tipped your candidate to be leading. Um, I mean, that's the first uh, that he's leading on. Most of the time, we see the Labour Party leading, uh, or sometimes the APC, but this is the first that we've seen that your candidate is leading. Um, what, what made that happen? And, and what do you think the PDP candidate has done uh, that has been a departure from the norm that's taken him all the way to the top? Yeah, what he did was very simple, clear and unambiguous. He never moved from church to church. He never moved from mosque to mosque to run campaigns based on religion. So he, he stood focused on his campaign of unifying Nigeria and is, um, propelling some. That is using our dynamic diversity as a unifying part, irrespective of where we come from, irrespective of religion. And that was why he was deliberate in his campaign, uh, speaking to all Nigerians, irrespective of religion. He didn't visit churches, not out of out of respect for the body of Christ. Right? He didn't visit more. Oh, my goodness. I think that we're having connection yes, issues with you. Me. Mr. Schreibel, uh, we, we lost your connection for a second there. Can you hear me? It tells you somebody who is the face of unification in Nigeria, who, who means what he's talking about. And Nigeria sort of can, can see through um, his message. That he... uh, Mr. Schreibel, we're having connection issues with you, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you hear Hello? me? Yes, we, we lost the connection with you for a second there. Can you hear me now? Mr. Shaibu, can you hear me? All right, we'll take a quick break and bring you back on. Let's, let's fix that. We're still being joined by Frank Shaibu, essay on public communication at Tiko Okowa campaign organization. Before we, we lost that connection with you, you were trying to tell us that your candidate has been more deliberate in his campaign as opposed to others who go to places of worship. What is exactly wrong with going to places of worship? No, what, what, is, it, what is wrong with going to places of worship is the fact that, look, we are a multi-religious um, society in Nigeria. You know, and we are supposed to, with over to over a hundred and something, uh, uh, actually over two hundred and something ethnic groups. So we have to use our dynamic diversity as a unifying factor. We are not meant, you know, to begin to use religion as a weapon of communication, particularly as it relates to campaign for elective office, and as it relates principally to even campaigning to the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, because we are we have never been as divided as we are today in Nigeria. And because of that, we have to do everything possible. Anybody who wants to be the president of Nigeria should not campaign on ethnic lines, on religious lines, on tribal lines, on primordial sentiments. It should be focused on what we intend to do. And that is one of the core messages, one of the deliberate steps that Tiku Abubakar took in the course of our campaign that the people keyed into. Yeah. Another major thing is that, oh, some person started by, by the, with the fact that, oh, Atiku is 76 and all of that. 
Also, and when we were able to educate them, that look, age is not a parameter for measuring capability. And he has proven by, by moving his campaign trail for, to over 35 states across the country, except rivers, owing to which we could not go to, owing to insecurity and threats, you know, to life and all of, all, all of that. Mm. That he still met with stakeholders. You know, that notwithstanding, uh, he has a robust um, work plan which is entitled his covenant with Nigerians. And in that work plan, he encapsulated and captured about five thematic areas um, when elected into office is going to deal with. Mm -hmm. Beginning from beginning from unity of the country and um, forming the government of national unity when elected to bring about, you know, uh, not just when you want to unify, it's not just unification just by paper or on paper, mm -hmm. but by trying to make sure that all political appointments cut across board, where every section of the country is represented. So you cannot talk of unity without quality, with equal and quality representation by all sectors of the of, of the country. Every tribe is important, no matter how small. Every every human being is important. So far, the person is Nigerian. You are important, and that was one of the core messages. The other the other one was is based on security, security of life and property. Only yesterday, only yesterday morning, I lost one of my staff. You know, I'm a school owner. I am a proprietor. I'm a teacher. And my staff stepped out of, the, of her house two days ago, two meters away from her door. A young man who obviously must be under the influence of a substance, or substance abuse, or overdose of substance, or whatever, we don't know, you know, held her by the neck and stabbed her on the on the on the lap, and disappeared into thin, into thin air. He didn't take her phone. He didn't take her bag. He didn't collect money from her. So obviously, you know that this one is under some kind of influence, and that is why we have been very deliberate and we have you know been reminding Nigerians that this is not a time where you contemplate voting any candidate based on geography. This is not a time where you contemplate voting any candidate who has history of any connection, you know, with either substance abuse, trafficking, or in whatever sense, or heroin, or cocaine, or anything, any drug-related thing. Because our country, we are at very perilous times. Our young people are just littered on the streets. They can't go to school, no job for them, and we have over 20 million out-of-school children at this time. 20 million out of school, 20 million out of school children is, is too much a number, too much a figure. That's a figure that is more than certain countries in Africa put together. You know, so it is, it is, it is, it is uh, something that is, is very dreadful. And we believe very firmly that at this point you need someone who is deliberate, someone who knows the importance of education, someone who knows the importance of manpower development like Atiku Abubakar, who, who, has, who, who has been involved in the running of schools in the last 25 years, up to the time he established the American University of Nigeria, situate in Yola. Unlike other candidates who would even move schools on legitimate school plots, like the Lagos State Polytechnic that was moved from somewhere in Ketu to somewhere in Ikorodu, a suburb in Lagos, inconveniencing students and parents, and decided to acquire the place and set up a private enterprise on the same property. So that's not the kind of leadership we desire for this country. Okay. We desire leadership that will be proactive, leadership that will, that will be representative of the yearnings of the young people. Education that should be representative of the yearnings of the young people. Where they will not just go to school to read A for Apple, B for ball, C for cat, or D for dog. But they will go to school and, 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 and learn and acquire skills that will better their tomorrow. Where they can diversify. And like I think you told me some time ago in my previous interaction with him, he said, Frank, a time will come when certificates will not even be as important as what he called certificates. He made a coinage. He called it certificates. Certificates. And I said, Daddy, what do you mean? He said, look, a lot of young people are doing very well in areas that did not even study, in areas, areas that did not even invest in educationally okay. at the level of the university. And that is why, that is, and the reason for that is because they took time to go into what they call self and personal development and went into to learn skills, you know, uh, pass through schools that, that they had the opportunity to acquire okay. certain skills. And that is what they are deploying 
And that okay. is the kind of leadership we're talking about. Let's and he went for that, he told me, so in, in, in one of our rallies, can you hear me, please? Yes. In one of our rallies, he told the young people, you know, when he, when he inter interfaced with them, he said, look, I am Atiku Abubakar. My desire for the young people in Nigeria is to raise them to a point where they will not just be dependent on our oil, but they will be, depend will be dependent on what they can do. Okay. That is why he wants to incentivize the private sector, the movie industry, and so many other industries. The moment we're able to take the young people out of the street, it will reduce insecurity. If you notice, if for ban banditry, armed robbery, um, kidnapping, if you notice the number of people they have arrested so far in the course of in the last seven and a half years, the young people below the age of 35, 40 have numerical preponderance over people above 45. You understand me? So what it represents is that a majority of our young people need to be gainfully engaged. Okay. Because if failure to do so, we bring in security. And such a situation will bring, will bring will, you know, be occasioned by lack of self-confidence poor image perception, and an unhealthy identification. And that is why the article message has been able to percolate among both the young and the old, and that's why we are very confident that, you see, this election is a referendum on the seven and a half years of the APC, seven okay. and a half years of maladministration, seven and a half years of hunger, seven and a half years of tears, seven and a half years of blood. Lit out on the streets of Nigeria. All right, I want I want to come in. I want to come in, Mr. Shaibu. Just give me a, give me a minute. Um, let's talk about the elections in itself. I mean, it's just around the corner. Uh, it's one thing to campaign for the election. It's also another thing for people to show up um, for this election. Now, um, a group of people from the north have um, reached out, uh, put out a statement saying that the north votes would be split because there is a, an Atiku in the election and there's a Kwan Kwesto. And they're saying Atiku has to step down for Kwan Kwesto so that the, the Northern votes can stay, um, you know, and count more as it normally does, as opposed to, you know, having two people from the North who would split the vote. Uh, do you care to comment on that? Well, I don't know. The, uh, it depends on, uh, you didn't mention the group of people who, who made such uh, allusions or maybe who are they dreaming. But if there are people who are qualified to enjoy a response from me, why not? But because you didn't mention them, I don't think uh, it, would be, it would be completely out of place for me to talk about it. But the beautiful thing is the fact that even Kwan Kwasso himself knows that this election is a two-horse race between Atiku Abubakar and the candidate of the APC, who are suddenly capitulated into the opposition party, you know, who have been forced into the opposition party because of the failure of their government and their own leadership. They have been the one now crying, they are the ones who have been shouting. They are the ones who have been casting as passions on their own president, president of their party. You know, they are questioning the policies of their own party, a party where their candidate has been a leader. He has been a leader of their party. They conceived the, 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 the concept of uh, the, the Naira swap and Naira redesign. It was conceived by them. It was given birth to by the APC. It was nurtured from infancy by the APC. And it has seen the it has seen the daylight. You know, unfortunately for them, they didn't know that, you see, Nigeria, they met in 2015, is different from the kind of Nigerians we have in, in 2023. The Nigerians we have now are a set of people who have been impoverished. They are a set of people who have seen hunger. They are a set of people who have tasted pain. They are a set of people who have, who have, who have, who have been tearing. They are a set of people who have seen blood. You know, so these Nigerians, have resisted and rejected them. And because they are lost, they are in quandary. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to go. They don't know what, how to proceed. So the first thing they did was that their candidate went to somewhere in Abeokuta, in Okun State, and he said, look, the policy of Mr. President is targeted at himself, his candidature, and his aspiration. Including, but not even limited to the first scarcity that started over nine to ten months ago. So I re we replied in, in, one, in one breath that, look, it is possible that even the, any day his wife decides to stop sleeping with him, he will blame Atiku Abubakar. Atiku, for the record, Atiku Abubakar has not been in office since 2007. He has been a free man. He has been a free man. He has no immunity. Some will even cast, throw more, throw rape more, throw stones at him and say, oh, the man is corrupt, he's this, he's that. 
a man who has no immunity, he's been corrupt since 2000, between 2007 to date. No court in the land has subjected him to any form of trial, neither has he been convicted for any form of corrupt offenses. Okay. Or okay. So the beautiful thing is, the people have decided. The people have rejected them. They are aware they are being rejected. And they've been running from pillar to post. And what, you makes, you, and what makes you think, Frank, what makes you think that these people that you think have suffered from the APC, who have also, one way or the other, pointed fingers at the PDP for also for a one way or the other a maladministration, they've also, I mean, one of the reasons why the APC came into power in the first place was because they rejected the PDP. What makes you think that these people are going to run towards your candidates? And why should the average Nigerian vote for uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar? The, the, the average Nigerian will vote for anybody who has the right head sitting on the right shoulder knows that the right person to do this job at this moment when Nigeria is divided and polarized is a Tiku Abubakar. Apart from that, his, anti his antecedents speak for itself. They feel the first place. I am in Abuja. You are in Lagos. How are we communicating? How am I able to appear on your television station? We are using internet facility. We are using my phone. Before now, until the liberalization of the telecom sector, Led by His Excellency Atiku Abubakar, when President Obasanjo came to power with Atiku as Vice President, we wouldn't have been able to do what we are doing now. I would have had to fly to Lagos to be able to appear on your program. But today, here, here am I in Abuja, sitting in the comfort of my small office, and I'm able to speak to you. I'm able to appear on your television station. And the majority of our people out there, Nigerians, are watching me live from your station. This is one of one of the visible things, tangibles, okay. that came through the man Atiku Abubakar. Some will say when he talks about privatization, oh, he's going to sell in Nigeria or some or some of our assets to his friends and colleagues. We have so many telecommunication companies in Nigeria. El Rufai himself, the governor of, of um, Kaduna State, an APC governor, was chairman of the Bureau of Public Enterprises that were that was in charge of privatization process in Nigeria. It is documented in his work, in a well-documented book, The Accidental Public Service. He stated clearly and in unambiguous terms that Atiku never interfered with the process of privatization. And neither did he recommend anyone, anyone for that matter, mm. to, for, for any public asset to be sold to him. So Atiku is prepared for the job. He came, even before he picked up the phone for the presidential election from the PDP, he came with a working document. He okay. came with a plan. Okay. None of these candidates is as prepared as Atiku Abubakar. Okay. He is experienced, he is able, he is capable. He does not stutter, he does not um, be, he does not he does not talk, you know, he, he, does, he, he is coherent. He is not incoherent. He okay. does not raise his hands when he is singing national anthem. Okay. He does not talk about Bala, Bala, Bala Blue and um, and all of that. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shai, Mr. When he is speaking. <laughs> Yeah. We have to go, but quickly, do you have any concerns? And do you, does your candidate have any concerns for Saturday? Um, we have had pockets of violence here and there in closing because we do not have time. This is, I have just 30 seconds. What are the concerns and, and what should the average voter be looking out for? Mr. Shwaibu, can you hear me? We're going to try to get him back in a few seconds because we need to hear what the PDP um, has for the average voter. Mr. Schreiber, can you hear me, please? Um, I think, guys, can we have Mr. Schreiber's audio so that we can hear what he has to say finally? Uh, Frank, can you hear me? Mr. Schreiber, can you hear me? Oh, well, it's unfortunate we are unable to get his audio, but... Um, Frank Shaibo is the Special Advisor on Public Communication at Tikwa Koa Campaign Organization. We want to thank him for being part of the conversation. Um, if you can hear me, good luck on uh, the elections on uh, the uh, 25th of February, 2023. My name is Mary Anna Kun. That's the show tonight. We'll be back tomorrow as we open our election studios, getting ready for the elections on Saturday, the 25th of February. Have a good evening. <laughs>